its flavor from the streets. I've got weight on my back, create shift and bend. I've got flavor from the streets. Come take a trip with me. Don't hesitate, just leave.
Bahia, capitão de areia. Capitão de areia, capitão de areia. Todo abandonado na Bahia, capitão de areia. Capitão de areia, capitão de areia. Todo abandonado na Bahia, capitão de areia. Online, a virtual reading series presented by Asian American Theater Artists of Boston. My name is Sarah Shin, and I am the lead producer for ATAB Online. ATAB is a social collective that seeks to empower and connect Asian American, Pacific Islander American, Mena American, and Kanaka Maoli theater artists in the greater Boston area. We've gathered theater artists from the ATAB community, the Boston theater community, and friends across the country to explore plays by Boston based Asian American playwrights to present here on Zoom, Facebook Live, and HowlRound TV. Today, you are seeing a reading of Incredibly Annoying Women by Rosanna Yamigawa Alfaro. For this reading, we would like to amplify Families for Justice as Healing, a Roxbury-based, Boston-serving grassroots organization led by incarcerated women, formerly incarcerated women, and women with incarcerated loved ones. Um, that they are this organization that works to end the incarceration of women and girls by leading work to shift resources away from the criminal punishment system and into housing, healthcare, education, economic development for black and brown communities. Uh, depending on where you're watching us from, there will be a link to donate directly to um, to that organization in this, in this Zoom room or on uh, the HowlRound page or in the Facebook comments. Um, I also would like to give a content warning for our play. In our second monologue, there is a mention of suicide and depiction of self-immolation. And in our fifth, our last monologue, there will be some flashing lights to depict fireworks. Uh, if you want more info about ATAB, we are on Facebook and Instagram at A-A-T-A-B-O-S-T-O-N. And now, enjoy the show. The deafening sound of parrots and howler monkeys. The sound of roller skating. She repots her geranium. A whooshing sound and flashes of lightning. Wreckage everywhere. A handwritten sign with the words, Kathy Change. 1950 to 1956. The sound of a small audience before the show starts. Incredibly annoying women. Not a playground. The sound of roller skating lights up on a woman in her 60s. She talks to her neighbor as she repots a geranium. On her patio table is the geranium in a plastic container and a trowel. I know they're kids. I know they need to bring up a lot of steam, but this is a small cul-de-sac. I... I have 
have, and this cul-de-sac is populated by the old and feeble. George can say what he wants, but I bet this is driving him nuts. He probably hides out in his wine cellar where, whenever he hears the roar of the roller skates. It probably is worse down there. When the kids crash into my garage door, the whole house shakes. I mean, I know the twins are just letting off steam, but I feel like saying my life matters too. Old people's lives matter. Well, of course, the twins themselves don't consider things like this. I mean, how could they? They're eight years old. When I stepped out into the lane last week, they whizzed by and almost knocked me over. And suppose someday they crash into poor George. How would they feel then? I mean, how would they feel about you? Their mother who never took the time to teach the, the difference between right and wrong. Who didn't care if she put the elderly at risk. I know you and your husband are busy people. George told me you're both doing research on some exotic jungle virus. Oh, I'm sure you need a little peace and quiet when you get home from the lab. I understand that. The four of you must be going crazy cooped up in your small townhouse. No wonder you strap on those roller skates and push those kids out the door. <laughs> oh, everyone's on your side. We're a friendly lane, which is important when you're living cheap to jowl. Luckily, George moved next door after we divorced. Oh, not far enough, if you ask me. And, and next to you is, is the, just those lovely Kate and Jenny living very, very happily underneath the same roof. You know, whenever they hear your kids come out, they come out loudly cheering them to, on to do their tricks. Kate says it brings back the childhood memories of uh, roller skating with the boys. <laughs> oh. oh, you're all ganged up against me. But in spite of what you say, I'm not a wicked witch hiding behind a, a leafy wall of my patio, camera in hand, spying on little children. Look. No, oh, I'm sorry. I startled the twins when I emerged from behind the ficus, but I just wanted to show them the videos. I took of them riding piggyback with their roller skates on. No, 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 you're wrong. It's perfectly legal to take videos of what's happening in front of your own house. I took those videos to protect myself. What happens if the twins crash into my glass door? Who's liable for the cuts and bruises, not to mention the damage to my property? At least I now have proof I saw it coming and did my best to prevent it. Ugh. Yes, this is a new geranium. I bought it to replace the one that fell off the roof yesterday. Yes. Yes, the one that landed near your kids. I'm sorry about that. You'll be happy to know Kate and Jenny banged on my door and chewed me out about it. As you may or may not have noticed, I'm quite unsteady on my feet these days. I have vertigo, a common ailment you might consider studying as soon as you're through with your exotic jungle virus. When I lean over, as I do when I'm watering my plants, I sometimes lurch forward. Usually, usually I catch myself, but this time I trip my geranium. Oh, it was an accident. I kept that plant alive through five winters, which is close to miraculous. It was my favorite. 
Even you can't believe I would deliberately destroy my beloved geranium just to scare your kids. It was an accident, but I also took it as an omen. How many skips can a pebble make on the surface of the water before it sinks into the bottom of the pond? The potential for something very bad to happen exists whenever the kids are running around unsupervised. This is not a playground. It's a driveway. And the first thing that comes to mind is the twins could easily be run over by a car. At my age, I don't trust my reflexes. And any more so, I drive with extreme caution. I turn very slowly into the lane. But what happens if the little one suddenly darts in front of my car? Last night, I dreamt I somehow managed to hit both of them at the same time. Now, you know, and I know, you have nothing to worry about from me. But what about the others? Kate drives like a truck driver. She comes swooping into the lane. I pray every day for the safety of your children. I pray they someday grow into sensible, responsible adults. I pray they grow to up in one piece. I'm not trying to pick a fight. I'm not going nuclear. I have nothing against kids. I like to think I'm the kind of person that would, given the right situation, protect them with my life. I know you and your husband are good people, that you're both busy doing important work. No one could have been more shocked than I this morning when I woke up and saw go home, paint, spray painted across your garage door. Later, I saw George hobbling over with an old can of white paint to cover up the damage. He's sometimes sweet that way, but it'll take a professional to do the job. <sighs> These are tricky times, especially for you. Like it or not, there's a new sheriff in town. And I suggest you corral those young coyotes of yours. <laughs> I don't believe we should handcuff eight-year-old kids. I don't believe all Mexicans grow up to be killers and rapists and drug dealers. But believe me, you have a couple of terrorists on your hands. I'm sure the twins were once very happy and well-adjusted. But I can also imagine they find things very different here where, than where you all come from palm trees, the sparkling water, the young couples in love, lots and lots of little children running around, playing in the streets until midnight. Sounds pretty idyllic to me. So how can you stand it, living in a country that doesn't want you here, that's building a wall to keep you out, <laughs> a 2,000 mile long, 20 billion dollar wall? If I were you on your, in your shoes, I'd pack up pronto and hop on the nearest plane. Things aren't going to get better in this country for you, for folks like you. So round up those terrorists, those bad hombres of yours and go home. Oh, look, look who's coming out of your house, your husband. He probably thinks I've kidnapped you. <laughs> He's taking the twins to the park. Right, all right, yeah, you better go join them. Bye, bye. Yeah, we'll talk later. <sighs> Sorry you had to listen to that, darling. 
It seems all I do these days is rant and rave. But you know what? Afterwards, I feel emptied out of everything bad. That sound of gremlins deep down in my brain. Oh, thank God, that nasty bitch and her horrible children are gone. Let's go inside and take a little nap before they come back. Oh, yeah. Torched. College Green at the University of Pennsylvania. A handwritten sign with the words Kathy Change, 1950 to 1996, leans against a podium in front of the university's large stainless steel sculpture of the peace sign. An Asian American woman enters with a push cart. She's slightly out of breath. Sorry, sorry I'm late. I, uh, I had a bad day at the office. Uh, I had to get everything in order, the push cart and all its goodies. Uh, Well, here we are, 23 years later, and Kathleen is still with us. As she said, I'm not checking out. I want to free my spirit so it can jump inside of you. The uh, Dean's office sent me here for a couple of reasons. First of all, I'm Asian American. That's pretty obvious. My colleagues assumed I must know something about Kathleen that ordinary people wouldn't. And they're right. I identify, well, I semi-identify with Kathleen Chang. As the sociologists say, it's hard to say just where ethnicity leaves off and personality begins. The other reason the Dean's office sent me was I was right here when I was one of the 50 or so people who saw it happen. It's not easy living in a country where you're not exactly the norm. Kathleen's classmates at the Bronx School of Science called her chink and flat face. At least no one could say she was bow-legged like a daikin or short and squat like an eggplant. A uh, early photo of her shows a gorgeous young woman dancing outdoors with a young man. She's spinning with her arm up in the air and they're in front of a save the earth sign, but she's not all militant or self-conscious. She's in the zone. Kathleen's parents didn't work in the restaurants business the way my parents did. Her father was a professor of Chinese history at Harvard. And her father and brother were also professors. Her mother was a writer about utopias, no less. Kathleen's own life was far from idyllic. At 13, when her parents divorced, she slit her wrists. At 14, when her mother committed suicide, Kathleen was the one who discovered the body. She touched her mother's face, which was still wet with tears, and she moved her arm and heard it creak. Her mother had overdosed on barbiturates after a fight with Kathleen the night before. Kathleen never finished college, which must have freaked out her family, but she married Frank Chin, the brilliant playwright who wrote Chicken Coop Chinaman. Frank was the first Asian American to ever have a show on Broadway. He was also a self-centered prick, a total bastard, something like my husband, Harold. And their marriage only lasted five years and she tried to take her life again. You might say suicide was in her genes. You might say Kathleen spent her entire life preparing for that final moment. She kept a diary, which she spelled D-I-E-E-R-Y. She also added an E to her family name, transforming Chang to change. The times were messed up as they always seem to be in America and Kathleen wanted to set things right. 
She had the exact same dreams that most of us have today of equality, world peace, nuclear disarmament, sexual freedom, and the, the legalization of pot. <laughs> if she were alive today, she would be dancing in front of the detention centers or on top of the border wall. Back then, Kathleen started what she called the Transformation Party and ran as a write-in candidate for any available elected office. Her slogan was, a vote for change is a vote for survival and fun. <laughs> she said in the future, she'd run in all elections, not only here, but everywhere, in every state of the union and all countries all over the world, all of this while living in an abandoned warehouse in West Philly. Now, uh, I'm not as flamboyant as Kathleen, but I also believe in change. In the Dean's office, I help out with, what else? Multicultural matters. <laughs> I'm the one they send out to events like this. I'm the one always on the go, putting out a little fire there while they're setting a little fire over here. <laughs> they don't always like my politics, but I'm still the one they count on to make sure all's quiet on the Eastern Front. And my husband, Harold, who works in the Penn Financial Office and makes twice as much as I do, says, I'm a troublemaker. He says, I'm a difficult person at home and at work. He's convinced that we Asians have to watch our step in America. He says, I've circulated too many petitions, spoken at too many anti-gun rallies. But the fact is, I can't even hold a candle to Kathleen Change. Oh. What am I doing talking to a crowd of complete strangers about Harold? <laughs> I'm, uh, I must be losing it. <laughs> you must think that they have sent you a crazy woman to talk about a crazy woman. <sighs> well, uh, Kathleen was convinced that the feds were after her and I totally believed her. Brash Asian women aren't appreciated by the powers that be and I should know. Just yesterday, I received an email from the Dean's office informing me that they were laying me off at the end of the semester. For absolutely no reason. You know, you know how hard we Asians work? Twice as hard as anyone else. I spent a sleepless night running down the list of my waspy colleagues in the Dean's office, trying to figure out which one of them had played Judas, which one had given me the kiss of death. When you think about it, it's amazing. Kathleen lasted to 46, just, just my age. A cousin of hers told the New York Times that the family had cut her off because she was a slacker, unlike the rest of them who got where they were by working their butts off. Well, I'm sorry. Kathleen worked her butt off too. She spent nearly 20 years perfecting her solo performance demonstrations, her performance art. You could catch her show, rain or shine, on the Penn campus Monday through Friday and in front of the Philadelphia Museum of Art on Sundays. I was 13 when I first saw her singing and dancing in her homemade costumes. I especially remember a swimsuit with uh, two large stars on top and a little red, white, and blue striped bikini bottom. She looked like Wonder Woman. I'd never seen anything like her. So strong, so beautiful. At, at Penn, both the officials and the students treated her with benign neglect. But she called herself a freak, a pariah, and a fool. You over there in the flowered dress, I advise you to pick yourself up off the grass and take your little girls home with you. This next bit isn't particularly kid friendly. At 9 a.m. on October 22nd, 1996, Kathleen left brown paper packets sealed in duct tape on the doorsteps of her friends living nearby and at the offices of the Daily Pennsylvanian. The packets contained her last thoughts at 11 a.m., she arrived on campus 
and set up a push cart full of suicide notes right here in front of the peace sign. The peace sign you pass every day on your way to classes. And I ask you, where were all those people who received her packets? Why didn't they show up that day? Let me ask you a more immediate question. I've just told you I've been fired from the dean's office for no good reason. We could be in a recession any day now, and I don't want to move Jeff Harold for the rest of my life. Here is a petition telling the dean's office to give me my job back. You're all good people. All died in the wool liberals. Hands up if you'll sign it for me. What? No customers? Fine. Have it your way. To quote Kathleen, my charisma registers high on the negative scale. Let me ask you something else. If this were a real gas can, which it's not, it's just a prop, <laughs> believe me. Would anyone here rush up to save me? Would you, Harold? I see you there, hiding behind the bushes. through the campus that morning, having one of our heated arguments, when suddenly, just on the other side of the green, whoosh, a flame leapt up 10 feet in the air. Harold tried to stop me, but I ran toward it. The moment I got close enough to make out a human form at the center of the flame, I knew it was Kathleen. She was dancing, not kneeling in prayer like the hundreds, yes, hundreds of prisoners who immolate themselves in India and Tibet. Kathleen, was going out in a blaze of glory. I still have dreams of a fireball dancing with human hands and feet. Hopefully it wasn't unbelievably painful for her. Hopefully she was in the zone. Kathleen's last performance piece was planned months in advance. She thought no one would pay any attention to her unless she did something spectacular. In India or Tibet, Kathleen's death might have been seen as a noble form of martyrdom. But this is America. The president of Penn was obviously embarrassed that such a senseless, and tragic loss of life could have taken place on his campus. Harold said, Kathleen was a self-confessed freaking fool, that she should have died on her own time. She should have died the way her mom did, a sad private death. She should have thought twice before making a public spectacle of herself and made people think she was nuts. But all Asian Americans were nuts. I wonder if Kathleen noticed how slimy this stuff is. It seems every few weeks crazy Americans go on shooting sprees in schools or movie theaters or shopping malls. They take it out on others. Kathleen Change inflicted harm only on herself. She was disturbed, I know that. But she was also very brave. It takes guts to be a martyr for your cause. At the end 
of her diary. Kathleen wrote, call me a flaming radical, burning for attention. But my real intention is to spark a discussion of how we can peacefully transform our world. America, I offer myself to you as an alarm against Armageddon and a torch for liberty. All these years I've tried to imagine how a woman like Kathleen felt in her last moments. Call me a freak and a fool, but I'm drawn to Kathleen like a moth to a flame. She strikes the match. The lights go out. It doesn't take a tornado, a whooshing sound and flashes of lightning lights up on a woman in her 50s. She sits in front of her trailer park talking to a TV reporter and camera crew. Wreckage everywhere, but the woman's trailer is intact. Do I have a minute to spare? Young lady, you can have a minute, an hour. You can have the rest of my life if you want it. I've already talked to the fire chief. He's a nice man. And the deputy coroner, who's a real jerk, and someone from the county sheriff's office. Well, I guess I'm the only one left around here to talk to. Everyone else is lying in the morgue or, or worse yet, the, the city hospital. It was awful. My dog, Hank, I saw him sailing through the air, all 70 pounds of him. He just flew past along with the two cats. Damn. The trailer is okay, thank God. The forest behind me, untouched. Not a branch, not a twig fell to the ground. You don't believe me? Go look for yourself. Tornadoes are attracted to metal. That's why they hit trailer parks and power lines. I'm attracted to trees myself. That's why my trailer is out of the loop, backed up against the forest. I knew I would come out of this just fine, which I did, thank God. Most everyone else, they lost all they had. Howie and Janice in number six, they were headed for a divorce. And this will speed things up, you betcha. That shiny hundred foot trailer that was trucked in just yesterday, when its owners come looking for it, They'll find it on its side over there in the swamp. I sat out here and watched the whole thing until it got too close. I tell you, it was amazing. The smell of the electricity in the air, the way the funnel touched down here, then there, taking out power lines, boom, kaboom. Then it sat right down on the trailer park and wiped it off the face of the earth. It's a sad business. My ex-husband in number six, Roof, fell in on top of him and broke his back. Oh, don't be too sorry. I'm certainly not. Put him out of his misery, <laughs> poor slob. Children? Oh, oh uh, two of them. Molly is in California. Matt in Florida, I think. I tell you, it doesn't take a high wind to scatter a family to the four corners of the earth. It doesn't take a killer tornado. Other accidents can throw you off course. I'd like to invite you and your crew in, but to tell you the truth, there's as much a mess in there as it is out here. Wall to wall junk. I can hardly make it to my bed at night. <laughs> my ex-husband used to say, people who don't know how to throw stuff away shouldn't live in a trailer park. There's no storage space in a trailer. Stuff tends to accumulate by the bed along the side of the walls. Then it starts accumulating in the yard. 
takes a tornado to clean house. Just look at everybody's junk that's landed in my front yard. You folks, national or local? It doesn't matter. It's just that my brother sitting snug as a slug in his colonial home with five pillars in Michigan, he sees news like this. Are you watching Fred? And he says to his wife, Susie, God doesn't like trailer parks. That's the sort of thing he says whenever he sees folk like me on the 11 o'clock disaster news. You know what I mean? He sees some poor kid shot up, strapped to a stretcher, loaded into an ambulance, and he says, serves him right. If my mat were on the news, my brother would say to Susie, I told you so. Well, I don't care what he says. Fact is, he'd watch a nuclear bomb coming down the, on his head and his last words would be, I told you so. There's no point in talking to a man like that. It's a crazy world we're living in. You think you're safe, then kaboom, you're blasted to bits. You don't need to be in Syria or Afghanistan. Look at little May Swap in number 12, thrown 200 feet with her baby brother in her arms. Mother Nature, she keeps an eagle eye on her children. Just keep a low profile and duck for cover. Don't go out looking for trouble, am I right? My boy, Matt, a week before he shot his girlfriend, I found the gun he shot her with under his pillow. I said, why do you have a gun? Is someone out to get you? No, he said. He hadn't bought it for any reason in particular. He said he bought it because he happened to have $80 in his pocket. Well, the next thing we know is girlfriend's in the emergency room and I'm putting Matt on the next flight to Florida. A 15 year old kid like that, so dumb. He thinks he can shoot someone and go back to school the next day. I blame my ex-husband for the way Matt acts with women. I kicked the bastard out of my house a year ago. I said there wasn't room enough for him and all the rest of my junk. Of course, that wasn't the real reason. You know, the woman they found lying in the mud with a broken leg. Well, you call her a registered nurse if you want. I call her a certified nutcase. My husband didn't notice, of course. He never noticed. Half the women he slept with, and that was half the women in the trailer park, were crazy. Let me tell you something. The fact that they were crazy made it easier. You understand what I'm saying? The place was a regular Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe that's what made God pick it up and throw it down. Huh. That's exactly what I felt like doing to my husband, picking him up and throwing him down because those women of his, each one was like a stone on my chest. The day I kicked him out of my house, it was like I was ridding myself of a huge weight that was killing me. I took everything of his I could find and threw it out after him. His six packs, his precious collection of hustler, his lazy boy recliner. In between, I was jumping up and down something I never do, but I noticed my legs were working just fine. I don't know how I got the strength. I tell you, it was like throwing boulders, uprooting trees and hurling it at him. And now it seems as if God seen fit to finish up my work. So what the hell are you smiling like that? The interview's over. End of sideshow. I know your tight little girl showing up in your blue blazer, designer jeans, poking around, looking for rural catastrophes like yours truly. Takes a tornado to bring types like you out, of, out to our neck of the woods. Well, if you're looking for a good picture, I suggest you hike down the road a bit to the community Baptist church. From what I've been told, it's quite a sight. I hear it was sort of eased off its cinder block foundations and said flying into the arms of the Lord. <laughs> but, but, oh my God, hold on a moment. Oh my God, 
just point that camera in that direction. Do you see who's coming through the gate? It's Hank. My God, it's Hank. I told you the last time I saw him, he was sailing through the air. And here he is, Hank. Oh my God, come here, baby. Oh, oh Hank. I'm so happy. Let me see you, boy. Let me see now. Not a scratch. Not one scratch. Oh, you lick me in the eye. God, get a close up of me and Hank before you go, will you? <laughs> Not a scratch. Is this a goddamn miracle or what? Picking up the pieces, the sound of a small audience before the show starts. Zoe stands on a bare stage looking for someone in the audience. Good. <laughs> I'd say there are 37, ah, 38, <laughs> 38 people here. I am very good at counting the audience in small theaters. You can turn off the lights now. Ah, <laughs> much better. You need to focus on me. I don't really want to see you. <laughs> no. I don't want to know if a certain person I'm bad mouthing is sitting out there feeling sad or pissed off. Who needs that kind of distraction? <sighs> when I was chosen last year as the lead of the play at the Madison, Oh, I was over the moon. It was amazing. I mean, there are dozens of great actresses in this town, but they chose me. Josh felt the same way I did. Josh and I have both been in every 10 minute play festival, but no one would have guessed we'd be starring in the new show at the Madison. <laughs> It's so weird to be back on a small stage. Oh, um, I mean that in a good way. At the Madison, I was totally invisible. I discovered you have to be very large to fill a large stage. There are only three of us up there, Josh and me and Stacy. And the only one large enough was Stacy which was unfortunate because the play is actually about Josh and me, not Stacy. I mean, that's the way the script's written. Where the stars, Stacy provides the comic relief. For those of you who didn't see the show, Josh and I played the unhappily married couple. Stacy played my annoying best friend. When Josh strayed, Stacy was the one who made him see the error of his ways, and in the process, betted him herself. I don't want to give away the ending, even though this play will never see another production. But let's just say Stacy galloped off into the sunset, leaving Josh and me to pick up the pieces. Stacy had half as many lines as I did. But because of her outsized personality, even the 28-year-old director, imported from Chicago, had eyes for her only. I can't tell you how much time he wasted on things like, oh, should she enter stage left or stage right? Should she kiss Josh on the nose or on the eye? Well, who can blame him? Stacy's an attention snatcher. At theater parties, you can always find her smoozing with the most important person in the room. In the rehearsal room, that person was the director from Chicago. It's incredible, the amount of charisma that woman had. During scene breaks, <laughs> the director, playwright, set designer, everyone went running to her for advice. Stacy's opinion was the only one that counted. Never mind that she was completely oblivious to the play as a whole. She never stuck around to see what Josh and I were up to in our scenes without her. 
oh, no, our story just didn't exist for her. Ugh. In this world, it's the nasty, selfish ones that get everything. The rest of us are put here so they can shine. They see center stage while we sit around like idiots, waiting for the spotlight to find us. Once Stacy wrapped the director around her little finger, she zeroed in on the playwright. She badgered him to rewrite her throwaway scenes until they were shaped into perfect little arcs made up of one-liners. She herself surgically removed any lines that showed her in an unsympathetic light. I should mention here that the playwright didn't change a single word for me. I said, why is Stacy's language heightened and mine like comfort food? Uh, the audience will love her, they, but they won't even know I exist. <sighs> he really pissed me off when he rewrote my best scene and gave it to Stacy. I, I said, <laughs> look, I've written a few plays myself, so I know what I'm talking about. I know you want to please Stacy, everybody does. But that scene where Stacy beds my husband, then tells him to piss off? That's my scene. It doesn't make any sense that you gave it to Stacy. Josh is my husband, not hers. <laughs> the playwright hemmed and hawed, so I went straight to the director. I said, what the fuck is the playwright thinking? The director said, this is a comic scene. You might have the makings of a great tragic actress, but you'll never be able to land a joke like Stacy. To this day, I hear the director's name and the hair on my arm stand on end. When people ask what it felt like working with a hot young director from Chicago, I say, I haven't the slightest idea. I say, don't ask me about the director. Ask Stacy. He directed her, not me. They say, keep your enemies close. Don't let them out of your sight. Oh, I watched Stacy like a hawk. I studied her moves on stage and off like the ingenue and all about Eve. When she circled the stage, I circled the stage. The director said to me, why are you running around like a chicken with your head cut off? Just stand still and let Stacy do the running. <laughs> Josh said, I think he meant she was the mover, you're the linchpin. You're the still point of her spinning world? Whatever. Josh himself was feeling bad because the playwright, at Stacy's insistence, had cut most of his philosophical meditations on the nature of love. Stacy said, and well, here I had to agree with her, that every time Josh turned away from us and spoke directly to the audience, all momentum was lost. Cut to the chase, she said to him. Fondle me and press me against the kitchen wall. I'll turn things around, take my pleasure of you, and head out the door. Enough said. <laughs> Josh called me up that night. He said he wasn't sure. Stacy, or the director, if they both hated him. He said, I don't know about you but I can't see the jungle for the crocodiles and boa constrictors. I was very happy floating on my back in the small pound pond of 10 minute plays, but here I am splashing around in the ocean, chased by sharks and no shore in sight. Poor Josh. His doctor had just told him he had this weird medical condition. His stomach had somehow squeezed itself through a hole in his diaphragm up into his lung cavity, close to his heart. Have you guys ever heard of this? It's called a hiatal hernia. That's odd, isn't it? I've always associated hernias with another part of the male anatomy. Hmm? He swore me to secrecy, but everyone noticed his discomfort, his volleys of bumps and wheezes. <sighs> Josh wasn't the only one feeling sick. The day before dress rehearsal, I got a cold sore. My mouth puffed out. I said to Josh, careful, careful when you kiss me. 
I had also gained 10, 10 pounds during the rehearsal period. I looked like a tank. Josh said, it's not stress, it's distress. He said, different folks show it in different ways. I mean, look at me, I'm, I'm ribs, ribs. <laughs> and he was right. We look like Jack Spratt and his wife. No wonder the director said we should work on our chemistry. Josh was barely on speaking terms with the director, who had canceled two coaching sessions with him to have drinks with Stacy instead. On one of his midnight calls to me, he said, you're the only one who knows exactly what I'm talking about. You've had to put up with a lot of indifferent directors in your life. And Stacy hates you more, even more than she hates me. I have to tell you that that came as a blow, quite a blow. I wasn't sure who I hated more, Stacy or Josh for sharing that information. I'm not a paranoid person, but the next day I told Stacy to her face that she was deliberately coming in too fast with my few remaining lap lines. I also said she might do me the courtesy of looking and listening to me when I was talking to her. Stacy's, well, she said, you're the one who never reacts to a word I say. Admit it. You never make eye contact because you're afraid you'll forget your lines. Oh, dress rehearsals bring out the worst in people. Whenever Stacy was mean to me, I took it out on Josh. I said, no one respects an actor who doesn't fight for his lines or a character who caves in without a squeak of protest. Put a little more oomph in your lines. I can't play opposite a spineless, self-effacing, goody two-shoes. There's no bite to our squabbles. I bruise easily. But at the end of the day, there's no black and blue where you squeeze me on my arm. I hate playing your wife. Josh, <laughs> he let out a little burp and said, I wish I could say something equally mean and nasty to you, but right now I'm holding on by my fingernails. If I let go, my mind will fly off and never return. The tears welled up in his eyes. <laughs> That's an excellent expression. It suggests, no, I know it's not intended, that there's a deep well of sadness inside all of us. I remember what my father once told me. He said, don't let them see you cry. They'll kill you. And he was right. For one moment, I actually wished Josh dead. I felt like a jackal eager to put a wounded animal out of its misery. Opening night came and Stacy was on fire. The audience oohed and awed every time she made an entrance. It's scary for everyone else on stage when an actor gives off that special glow. Stacy's five foot two at the most. <sighs> but that night she was 10 feet taller than everyone else on stage. All the critics said she was gorgeous, which is surprising because Stacy's not even pretty. She's cute and smart. But if she were really pretty, she wouldn't have to play cute and smart. Now, ugh, don't get me wrong. Stacy has talent to burn. As she says herself, she's bold and brassy, sweet and sassy. She knows how to modulate her voice. Her voice has a range of <laughs> a good accordion. She took a dark and touching love story and turned it into a sitcom. The playwright had initially written her character as this loud, annoying bitch. And that's what Stacy is in reality, a loud, annoying bitch. But with all the rewrites, her character became the one you rooted for. The one who grew on you as she traveled her carefully self-manipulated arc. The scene where she tells my husband in the bedroom, the scene that should have been mine, <sighs> Well, the geriatric audience loved it when Stacy tore into Josh. Her voice was so loud and shrill, they didn't miss a word. The last two scenes, quiet, 
Stacy list scenes during which Josh and I gradually reconciled ourselves to a life of misery together seemed like an afterthought. Domestic bliss isn't something theater audiences particularly want to see, especially warmed over middle-aged domestic bliss. The nightly notes emailed to the cast by the stage manager said things like, you rock, Stacy, and woo woo. <laughs> the kiss on the nose and the blow to the eye brought down the house. The short curtain should have come down after that scene. The play stopped dead in its tracks. The critics gave us mixed reviews. Good for Stacy, bad for the rest of us. Have you ever noticed how when one critic says something, the rest automatically follow suit? They even used the same adjective. They dismissed Josh and me as one note, wooden, and dreary. <laughs> they said Stacy was funny, sparkling, vulnerable, even nurturing, which believe me, she isn't. Nurturing is the last word you'd use for Stacy. Even the director told me, you're the nurturing one, not Stacy. You're the good citizen. She's the headliner. Someone said critics are the ones who arrive on the battlefield after the war is over and shoot the wounded. A week after the reviews came out, Josh landed in the hospital. Stacy and the director rushed to visit him, but I didn't go with them. I told myself, most people don't really like to be visited after surgery. And they're embarrassed to be seen in their ugly hospital gowns. What Josh needs now is some good peace and quiet. The play had turned me into a monster. Stacy broke the news on local TV that the show was closing early. She dabbed her eyes and said her dear friend and co-star Josh had just had a serious operation and was in a coma. What was she talking about? Josh was my dear friend and co-star, not hers. Besides, Josh was never in a coma. The surgery was a piece of cake. The doctor untwisted Josh's stomach, popped it back through the hole in his diaphragm, and tightened the hole so it would never escape through his lung cavity again. Six months later, Josh is evidently out auditioning again. <laughs> they say he looks like Lazarus come back from the dead. They say he's lost 20 pounds and looks 10 years older. Theater takes a terrible toll. As I mentioned before, I gained 10 pounds during the rehearsals. I haven't seen Josh since the debacle, but I sent him a note telling him I wanted to write about it while it was still fresh in my mind. It would be a comic monologue, I said, showing the two of us warts and all. I didn't mention the piece to Stacy. I hear though, that through the grapevine, the director picked her for a small but lucrative role in his next play. They say she'll soon be on the train to Chicago. Well, I'm still in town. <laughs> After starting at the Madison, you'd think I'd get a few offers, at least locally, but my phone isn't exactly ringing off the hook. Turn the house lights on, please. I wanna see who's here. Does anyone see Stacy? Oh, I was terrified she'd show up uninvited. Ah, but wait, <laughs> look over there in the back row. I think it's Josh. Hey, hey buddy, wait up. Don't, don't, don't you dare try to duck out of the theater. <laughs> Holy shit, it's really you. <laughs> back from the dead and looking great. Come up here on stage and show these folks how great you look. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Give my co-star a hand, people. <laughs> he deserves it. Oh, I can't tell you how wonderful it feels to be back in this cozy little theater, surrounded by friends. Oh, I mean it. Thanks for being here. Oh, I love you guys. <laughs> Sailing down the Amazon. The deafening sound of parrots and howler monkeys. Oh, God. A boat sailing down the Amazon. 
We can imagine Rima sitting with her sleeping husband oh. stand on one side and a young woman on the other. Beautiful, aren't they? Take a sniff. They have a lovely pink aroma. They're from Marcus. I don't know how he found me here in the middle of the jungle. Well, he's an actor. Dramatic gestures comes easy to him. Sam says Marcus can't be trusted. He man manufactures the impulse. He bonds with Velcro. <laughs> but then, I've known Marcus for 50 years. After our first show together, he sent me a lovely bouquet of roses. And before they wilted, another arrived at the door. That year, he sent me a hundred bouquets, each lovelier than the rest. Sam here took a dim view of the proceedings. <laughs> no, no, don't worry, nothing wakes him. Not even the screeching parrots. He always sleeps like a log. And today, well, after all that excitement, he probably won't get up until it's time to go to bed. Not that I'm complaining. I put my finger under his nose every 10 minutes to make sure he's breathing. Oh, what a scare. Marcus always wanted to get together on my birthday, on his birthday, on Thanksgiving, Christmas and New Year's Eve. <laughs> on Valentine's Day, too. He is so outrageous. You can't change a leopard spots, especially if it's an old leopard. <laughs> uh, I, uh... I keep thinking I need to write a postcard, and then I, I realize it's a postcard to my mother, my dead mother, whom I loved more than anyone else in the world. What? What? Oh, dear. I'm sorry. He, this one here, he usually acts as my ears. Oh, what were you talking about? <laughs> you, you don't know either? Well, that's comforting. Ah, ah, yes, 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 yes. We were talking about Marcus. See, my hand was resting on the subject. That's an old actor's trick. Pick up a prop, it sets off the line. Things. Thank God. I've always been fond of things. I relate my whole body to things. Otherwise, I'd never know where I was in a play or in real life. What was I? Oh, yes. Sam. Sam. Sam, Sam says Marcus has become old and stupid and hasn't said anything new in the last 30 years. Not like the rest of us, of course. He also says that Marcus smells bad, the opposite of his roses. He says you don't always notice so much, but even when Marcus is on the other side of the room, there's a little bit of him in the air and in your nostrils. <laughs> Still... The man wants to run off with an 80-year-old woman. <laughs> well, that's quite something, isn't it? Just now, when you tilted your head that way, you looked, you looked very beautiful. No, really. The way your hair fell. I used to have hair like that. What? what? Well, oh, <laughs> thank you. Oh, it's not bad, is it? I have a lovely hairdresser in New York who's Japanese. His name's Luigi. <laughs> he makes sure everything is a nice shade of white, not gray or pink or blue. No, not that anyone cares what we look like in the middle of a jungle. Oh, this whole trip has been a disaster. I had a dream two nights ago. I was at the meat counter at Balducci's, and there was this skinned goat which was moving on top of the counter towards two rabbits which were dusted with flour on top of their fur. I don't know what Freud would make of that, but well, I'd say it's about the food they fed us on this cruise. Oh, that catfish they gave us for dinner is still flopping around inside my stomach. I have also been bitten by every insect in the entire jungle. Huh? Huh? <laughs> Fortunately, at 80, everything travels more slowly through the system. It'll be a month or two before I know whether I've caught something dreadful on this cruise. Malaria, maybe, or the bubonic plague. 
What? What? Oh, God! This is the problem I got from my mother. She gave me her beauty, but she also gave me her deafness. She said, when you're old and deaf, Rima, always enter the room talking. Don't stop to catch your breath. Don't allow anyone else to speak. Still fine. You, you would think that once I was deaf, this one would have taken over and done all the talking. You know, stays a coup d'etat. <laughs> oh, but au contraire, he became my translator. If he were awake, you would get a chance to say something. He would repeat it in my ear, and I would get it in here. It's a tragedy. These days, the only person I hear clearly is Sam. Oh, hello. Hello. Yes, we're doing fine. Thank you. He is happily napping, as you can see. He's been asleep all afternoon, so he'll be a nuisance all night. Uh, who was that? Oh, of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. Where did I put my brain? Somewhere it shouldn't be. What I hate most about this boat trip, that is before this morning, is being with the same people day after day in a confined space. People whose names and faces I have completely forgotten since the last meal. People have to be interesting these days or I, I forget them instantly. Most of the people on this boat go straight into the irretrievable file. When they start talking, I switch this off. Forgive me. You become an egomaniac when you get old. You talk about your ears that are deaf, your swollen legs, your irregular heartbeat. The hand, the arm of the Bilbao, the Nick Edison. <laughs> you, you, you don't have a clue what I'm talking about, do you? Oh, never mind. <laughs> Life is very sad. <laughs> you go through life in a haze. And just when you reach the age where you get it all together, your mind begins to go. Your brain is no longer connected to your mouth. I tell Sam, raise your finger if I've told you the same story once, two fingers if you've heard it twice and so on. And when you run out of figures, just give me a kick. <laughs> you laugh. What was it that some comedian said? A joke is no laughing matter. My friends joke about their senior moments, but for me, it's no laughing matter. I, uh, I have these glitches, terrifying little glitches. When I talk on the phone these days, the other person's words, they don't go into my brain. They, they somehow circumvent, they, they circumnavigate it. You think he has problems, but they are nothing compared to mine. No, 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 no. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. I was at the doctor's two weeks ago precisely because I was worried about my memory. And he gave me all these tests. Count backwards from a hundred by sevens. What? Oh, yeah, yes. That's right. That's right. Who can do that at any age? Fortunately, I had been warned about that one. You subtract ten and add three. Oh, I did that rather well. And then he said, list the presidents backwards. Why? Why do they ask you to do everything backwards? Because they know that you are having difficulty moving forward? Because it's their job to place obstacles in your way? <laughs> I told the doctor, I am an expert on turning my memory on and off. A week before a play, I am stumbling over my lines, but on opening night, I am flawless. The day a play closes, I sweep my mind clean so I can fill it up with a new play. I can't tell you the names of the plays I was in four years ago, much less who was president. 
The doctor wasn't impressed. He took some notes and sent me out to this crowded waiting room. Ten minutes later, he came out and said to me, in front of all these people, very loudly, so I could hear him, Well, it looks like dementia. Just like that. I know. Horrible. It was horrible of him. I was supposed to schedule an MRI, but I booked a cruise instead. And that is why I'm here, sailing down the Amazon. What? I know. I know. You're right. He could be wrong. He said so himself. But if, if I hadn't gone to the doctor, I'd still be myself, wouldn't I? One more dotty old lady like all the others on this cruise. I told Sam, uh, I didn't want to see any of our friends for New Year's, not even Marcus. Sam was delighted, of course, to have me all to himself. He says, as he always says, your command is my wish. <laughs> he said he read somewhere that there are still some cannibals painted blue in the Amazon. An uncle of his, a geologist, had gone on an expedition down the Amazon and never came back. Well, well that would suit me just fine. I don't know how to tell my friends about this. What? No. No, we have no close relatives. Well, I have a younger brother, Boris, whom I love dearly, but who annoys me the way an only a sibling can. I'd rather give him a kidney transplant than have him in the house for the weekend. Sam is an only child. What? We never had any children. Sam couldn't have children. Thank God. I wouldn't want them to see me, see me in this state. There's no cure for it. They can slow it down, but they can't stop it. <laughs> They'll probably give me Aricept. A friend of mine is using it. She hasn't noticed any change in her memory, but it has affected her bladder. Oh, she has just wear this harness that hitches up to here. And, oh, ah. Oh, yeah. yeah you're right, you're right, Summer. Someone might pass by. I've been doing a lot of reading. I am scrambling about, using half of my brain to search for and save the other half, which is lost. I'm like those desperate people you see on the TV news, piling sandbags on the banks of a swollen river. No matter what they do, they can't stop it. They can slow it down, but they can't stop it. What? What? No. No, no, you, you can't understand. You don't understand. I'm sorry. I am sorry. But you can't possibly begin to understand what I am feeling. I, I worry. I worry that I will forget everything that has ever happened to me. But the brain is a funny thing. They say people who have no memory at all can still ride a bike or play a musical instrument. There has to be a difference between the kind of memory that deals, or doesn't deal, with facts and numbers and the kind that is connected to emotions. Did I say that a minute ago? You, you never know. Oh. Oh. <laughs> those memories, they go to different parts of the brain. You never forget those. For instance, things that Marcus said to me 50 years ago, or the sensation when he first put his hand on me. <laughs> Never mind. I still remember everything. Oh, Marcus and I. Oh, we were in so many plays together. People think anyone can act, that it's as natural as walking and talking, but the fact is, it is the most difficult thing to do in the world. And Marcus and I were very good at it. Fame, fame, is actually a lovely experience. Everyone should try it sometime. You too, you should try it sometime. Oh, how do you put it? When the room is hot, the body temperature goes up. We were both quite famous for a while. Shows in New York, then tours across the country. This one. This one insisted on coming along. He said we shouldn't be apart because tragic things could happen when you are apart. 
That's what he said. Tragic things. And of course, he was right. Tragic things do happen when you're apart and when you're together as well. May I uh, have the rest of your lemonade? I, I see you barely touched it. <laughs> mm. Thank you. <laughs> oh. oh. Marcus and I were were cast together so often that we knew how to dance together verbally, mm. how to uh, tango, how to waltz, how to follow, to dip, how not to tread on each other's shoes verbally. If it's done well, you can lose yourself in mutual adoration, and everyone on the dance floor will notice, and the spotlight will find you. It's hard for me to describe my feelings toward Marcus. He's like a brother to me, but we have this slightly incestuous relationship. <laughs> oh, Marcus and I were in quite a few bedroom scenes together. And afterwards, we still had this mm, onstage glow. I remember riding with him on a crowded subway after one of our first shows. I must have been about your age. And we were sitting pressed together because there were two very fat people on either side of us. And I imagined, I imagined that we were in bed. The feeling was heightened because Marcus actually fell asleep. He was so exhausted after a matinee and an evening performance. Oh, and it was a long five minutes between stops being an express train. So I deliberately slowed down my breathing to match his. And then he lurched forward when the train stopped and I caught hold of him in my arms to keep him from falling. <laughs> Sam, of course, hates Marcus. But he puts up with him. You could say, I expect too much of life and Sam expects too little. He goes regularly to church to learn humility. I go to the theater for ecstasy. You don't get much of that at the Episcopal Church. Sam never flirted like Marcus. He just fell in love. This man has devoted his entire life to me. Marcus might not be as devoted as Sam, but he, he had this incredible warmth. You get close to him and, and you're wrapped up in this cocoon of warmth. It's, it, it's so hard for me to describe my feelings towards Marcus. He's like a brother to me, but, but we have this slightly incestuous relationship. I remember once we were sitting in the subway, pressed on both sides by two very fat people. Oh, and he fell asleep. I closed my eyes and I pretended I was asleep too, that we were in bed together. And when the train stopped, he lurched forward and I caught him in my arms. Hello, Nat. Yes, we're doing fine. Thank you. Still alive, he's been sleeping all day and now he'll be awake all night. Right, drinks at nine. <laughs> no, 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 I haven't forgotten. You're right to remind me. I have to be brought up to date every 10 minutes. The one man we know on this boat Nat Gardner, the playwright. That's right. The man who sits across from me at dinner. But the fact is he's paid much more attention to the young woman sitting next to him than he has to me, which ticks me off since I have acted for free in two of his staged readings. You know, you know how some men notice your hands, your hair, or your voice? Well, Nat notices your Achilles heel goes after it. He's an Achilles heel person. He stares at me across the table, the way he stared at those poor, the way we stared at those poor villagers we visited on shore yesterday, those pathetic descendants of the famous blue cannibals. A few nights ago, he said to Sam, loud enough so I could hear him, why'd you bring her? She's not any condition to appreciate it. Suppose she falls overboard. Isn't that funny? He said, suppose she falls overboard. 
few nights ago, I did a horrible thing. Nat had his shortwave radio on. He has the cabin next to ours, and it was on so loud. You couldn't hear the music, only the throbbing. I listened to this. I listened to this for 10 minutes, and it literally drove me insane. So I banged on the walls. I started shouting obscenities, obscenities. That's what Sam tells me. Vile, inappropriate thoughts you should only say on stage. Sam had to hold me back from going out into the corridor and kicking down the door. That's scary, isn't it? Isn't it? I have become a monster. I, 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 maybe, maybe, maybe that's what made Sam do it. I mean, pretty soon I, I might fly off the handle at the slightest provocation. That happens, doesn't it, people in my condition? They become violent. They have to be calmed down and drugged up. And when I banged on the walls and acted like a mad woman, Sam must have been frightened to death. That's the real reason he jumped overboard last night, escaping all of this. He was so desperate about my condition, it sent him right over the railing. Oh, I know, I know, I know. I know, he said, he tripped and fell. When they fished him out of the water, he looked, and I, I'm sure he felt genuinely embarrassed. He's never been one to call attention to himself. But you're right. He blamed himself for being such a klutz, and it's true. He, he is such a klutz. He's a stumbler. He'd, he'd trip over a blade of grass. He blames it on a weak angle, but it's laziness, pure and simple. You have to have lived with him for 50 years to fully appreciate just how annoying he can be. Sometimes when he trips, I buck at him so viciously my other self steals a peek to see how well he's taking it. But uh, this morning had nothing to do with clumsiness. To climb over a railing and jump into the river it takes something important to propel you to do something like that. Let's not kid ourselves. It was a deliberate, profoundly hostile act. He didn't want to spend the rest of his life looking after me in my condition. And who can blame him? Some things are too much for anyone, even Sam. He wanted to drown himself and leave me high and dry. You can just imagine the extent of his hostility. I'm so, oh, I'm so disappointed in him. When I saw him splashing in the water, I wondered where the crocodiles and piranhas were, not to mention the blue cannibals. They all seemed to have been caught napping. <laughs> I had a dream last night after I finally got to sleep. I dreamt I had awakened from a dream and found my mother lying in bed with me and Sam. She took my hand and held it very tenderly. Oh. Mm. It, was, it was such a nice experience. Still breathing. He's probably dreaming he's dead. <laughs> Look at that smile on his face. He's thinking how nice and peaceful it is far away from me in his watery grave. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing, huh? Spending New Year's Eve talking to an old woman on a boat in the middle of the jungle. I've always thought there was something sad, something wrong with young people who hang out with their elders. It's a new year. Life is short, believe me. You should be in a ballroom of a big hotel dancing the night away. When New Year's arrives in the Amazon, no one here will notice. The villagers are too poor. They have nothing to eat, nothing to celebrate. <laughs> I would rather be back in Manhattan, stuck in an elevator or blown up in Times Square. At the end of the year, everything becomes unglued at the seams. Have you noticed? How many people die in December? It is difficult to cross from one year to another. 
Luckily, it looked like Sam's gonna make it to the other side. Luckily, they fished him out of the river. Before we left New York, I, I forced Sam to buy me some pills to put in the bank deposit vault, just in case things got too unbearable. Now, the first thing I have to remember to do when I get back is to take those pills out of the vault. I have to make sure Sam doesn't get there before I do. Ah, uh, it's getting dark. <laughs> oh, you're afraid I might jump overboard myself, aren't you? Don't worry, I wouldn't dream of it. Sam's jump was cowardly. My jump will be heroic. And frankly, I don't think I'm quite up to it in my condition. I should throw these flowers overboard before he wakes up. A nice treat for the crocodiles. Well, that, that would be a cheap theatrical gesture, wouldn't it? A little gust of wind and they'd fly right back on board and we'd be chasing them all over the deck. If Sam saw one errant rose wedged under a deck chair, he'd know instantly where it came from. He was sure Marcus would find me here. He even bet me a dollar. <laughs> uh, I think it's best for everyone not to have any surprises. Best to maintain the status quo. Several loud explosions. Oh, oh what's that? Oh, oh, what? Oh, no, I'm, I'm fine. Perfectly fine. Oh, what a scare. Oh, for a moment, I thought the blue cannibals were attacking us. <laughs> Oh, look, look, they've woken him up. Oh, don't worry, my darling, don't worry. You're perfectly safe. I am right here beside you. Now, oh, it's good you're up. You've been sleeping all day, which means you'll be... More explosions. Oh, stop shaking, dear. No, 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 stop shaking at once. You're upsetting my young friend. Oh, it's nothing, nothing. It's the villagers with their firecrackers celebrating New Year. What? Oh, you're right. You're right. Just as you guessed, I owe you a dollar. <laughs> More flashes. Oh, no. No, no, no. No, no. I, I, I don't think you should. All right, fine. Let my young friend help you up. Come on. Oh, that's it. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Can't believe it. Look, look, look. Oh, look. It's a torchlight procession. Oh, the men are wading into the water. No, darling, no. I don't think they're intending to swim all the way to the boat. And the women, look. The women, they're throwing their flowers into the water, an offering to the river god. Well, I have flowers too, don't I? There. <laughs> Happy New Year, Marcus. God bless! End of play. Hello again. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'd love to bring back our cast and our creative team and Rosanna. I'd love to um, give a shout out to everybody. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes, thank you guys. Thank you audience all for watching and sticking with us through that. And thank you to this cast, um, Lisa, Yuen, Roxanne Morse, Kendra Jane, uh, Emily Kuroda, and Vijaya, uh, Vijaya Sundaram, um, and, and to our director Malika, and to our stage manager Karen, mm. um, and to our playwright Rosanna, of course. Thank you guys all so much for, for, for your work. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to say that it was an absolute pleasure to direct uh, this amazing crew of, of strong, wonderful, talented women. It was uh, inspiring to me and a learning experience for sure. And uh, I'm just really grateful for this opportunity. So thank you all so much for coming. And thank you, Sarah, for organizing this. Oh yeah, no, no, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I also wanna give, I couldn't have done it without um, Hubby players and also Chuang Stage, uh, also Mavis, Amanda Loto, Michaela Witt, um, and also Company One Theater and Pow Art Center. I want to give them all shout outs as well. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, I guess we'll, I think we'll just kind of hang out here and celebrate. If, if anyone in the audience like wants to just say hi, offer any questions or thoughts, like we will all just be here kind of enjoying ourselves. <laughs> Or also, Rosanna, I'm, I'm curious, like, how, what was it like to watch? How, what oh, I mean, it was so much better um, than it was when it was on paper. I mean, it was, they were so good. It was really, uh, and it improved, you know, incredibly also from, from rehearsal to rehearsal. And, uh, and it was just, it was really the, the directing, stage managing, and the acting was amazing. Thank you so much. Awesome. I mean, I'm very grateful. Yes, and I'm just so grateful for this space too. <laughs> okay, um, I think I think we should maybe maybe we should all um, stop looking at a screen. <laughs> maybe we can all we can all just kind of enjoy. We have been looking at the screens for a long time. <laughs> yeah. But um, I'll see you guys in the audience later, and I'll I'll talk to you. I'll see you guys this team later as well. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Rosanna. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Rosanna. Thank you. <laughs>